Good morning and welcome to worship with Homer United Methodist Church. As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship today, I invite you to light a candle to remind you that the light of Christ connects all of us wherever we are. Today is also the first Sunday of the month and traditionally the day that we celebrate communion together and we will do that today as well. So I encourage you to find something like juice and something like bread and have those handy so that later in the service we can share in the bread and the cup together. I also encourage you to print up or pull up your worship guide so that you can follow along with the liturgy. Let's take just a moment to listen to our opening song, prepare our spaces and our hearts for worship, and lift our hearts and minds toward God with praise. to worship. Normally I start and you respond, but this time you start and I'll respond. I'll say both parts so that we can all follow along together, uh, but I encourage you wherever you are to speak out loud today as we call ourselves into this time of worship. We come broken. This is a story of hope. We come fearful. This is a story of peace. We come cynical. This is a story of liberation. We come empty. This is a story of life. From nightly news about the pandemic to violence and disasters to personal and physical and relational pain in our own lives, it's really easy to see the brokenness of the world. It would be really easy for us to give in to cynicism and despair. But in Paul's letter to the Romans, we see how God is present with us, sustaining us and granting us wholeness and unity, whatever we face. In this new sermon series called Broken, Good News for Tough Times, we are going to explore some of that brokenness in the world and in our lives. And we're going to see how God is with us, drawing us towards salvation and wholeness. But before we jump straight to the joy, Let's take a few minutes to explore the brokenness that we face. Let's hear our scripture today from the book of Romans. A reading from the book of Romans, chapter 7, verses 15 through 25. This is the New Revised Standard Version. I do not understand my own actions. 
for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Every year I look forward to the Empty Bowl fundraiser for the Homer Community Food Pantry. Local potters donate bowls and all of our favorite restaurants in town make huge batches of soup. And in just one day, the food pantry raises thousands of dollars to help people in need in our community. I love going and looking at the tables piled high with bowls and picking my favorite ones. The first year of the fundraiser, I got this bowl and another one that matched it as well. These are my favorite huge soup and salad bowls now. I love the glaze on it and the colors. The next year it was Joe's turn to pick and he got this bowl. You can see that we really love blue. And another year we decided not to get bowls, but to get cups instead. And we got some pottery mugs. And this last year, I got this one. I love this bowl. I love the colors of it. I love the glaze. I love the shine of it. Unfortunately, one day when I was taking it down out of the cupboard, my hand slipped and I dropped it on the counter and it broke in half. But I couldn't bring myself to throw it away. Unfortunately, this is not the first bowl that I've dropped. This bowl used to have a companion as well, but I also dropped it and it smashed to pieces. I just couldn't bear to throw it away either. And so those pieces now cover the drainage holes of all my containers out in the greenhouse, helping bring new life out of old. When I broke this one, I knew that I just couldn't throw it away. I couldn't let it go. Even though it's broken, there's beauty in the brokenness and there's potential for new life in it still. In this series, we're going to talk about brokenness. We're gonna talk about brokenness in our own lives and brokenness in the world around us. In Christian terms, we call that brokenness sin. Sometimes we look at sin as discrete individual actions. We'll say, this is a sin or that is a sin. Things like the Ten Commandments come in to help us identify particular acts that are sinful, actions that we shall not do. In our scripture today, Paul talks about those kind of lowercase s sins, but he also talks about uppercase s sin. Sin as a whole category, as a negative influence, a cosmic force of evil that seeks to corrupt. And we can feel tugged between wanting to do what is right and good and those negative corrupting influences. Paul describes this when he says, I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind. 
This is part of the brokenness of our world. This is part of the frustration that we all feel when we want to do what is right, but it feels like nothing ever changes. This is our anger and our exasperation and our feeling that we are working and working and working for good, but we keep seeing evil continue to creep in. This describes our desperation and wanting to do better, be better, but still falling short. This is why Paul said, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that frustration? Have you ever felt that confusion and irritation at yourself when you know what you want to do, what you should do, and yet you find yourself not doing it? Has that ever made you feel kind of broken? That's the power of sin at work in our lives and in our world. It is easy to be confused about what sin actually is because we can think to ourselves, I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't dishonored my parents. I'm not awash in greed or wrath or lust. So I must not be struggling with sin. We can get distracted by traditional categories or definitions of sin and not realize that the insidious nature of sin means that actions that are innocuous or harmless to others can be sin to us. Sometimes mama knows best. So let's turn to Susanna Wesley, the mother of Methodism for advice. She wrote a letter to John Wesley when he was 22 years old. Now, I don't know if he wrote to her asking some particular questions or if she was offering unsolicited advice like mothers sometimes do, but this is what she wrote to John Wesley when he was a young man. She said, take this rule. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off your relish of spiritual things. In short, whatever increases the strength and authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may be in itself. That thing is sin to you, however innocent it may be. Almost 50 years later, in a letter of his own, John Wesley wrote this about sin. He said, nothing is sin particularly speaking, but a voluntary transgression of the known law of God. Therefore, every voluntary breach of the law of love is sin. Every voluntary breach of the law of love is sin. When you become aware that something has become sin to you, because like Susanna said, it weakens you, it impairs your conscience, it obscures your sense of God or elevates your bodily desires over your spiritual ones, and you try to change that thing, then you can understand Paul's struggle when he says, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. If you've ever tried to change a physical behavior. You know how hard it is to make changes. If you've ever tried to stop biting your nails, quit smoking, start waking up at an earlier time, drinking less coffee, you know 
that your nails can be bitten to the quick, that cigarette can already be lighted, the clock can tick past midnight, that cup of coffee can be halfway to your mouth before your brain even registers what your body has done from muscle memory. It's like when my mind tells me to stop eating, but my hand keeps putting potato chips in my mouth. <laughs> Just because we think something up here doesn't mean that the habits of our bodies change immediately. It's the same thing with sin. We can know what is good and right and holy, and we can long for it in our hearts, and we can commit ourselves to pursuing it, and we can still find ourselves right back where we started. We can long to overcome racism. We can work to be anti-racist. We can educate ourselves about systems of oppression. And yet we can find that the fear of confrontation has silenced us yet again. Or we've ignored an opportunity to give up some of our own privilege to amplify other voices because we don't want to lose control. Just like trying to change bad habits, trying to change our sinful urges can be difficult. When we struggle like this, when we struggle between what we want to do and what we know we need to do and then find ourselves doing something different, it can make us feel broken. I identify so much with Paul in this passage because I know what I want to do. I know what I ought to do. I know what I want to be doing and yet, all the reasons and excuses just let me slip back into that warm bath of denial and sloth. It can feel hopeless. And if all of this talk about sin right now makes you feel disheartened and depressed, if you feel downtrodden and sucked down into the sadness of the seeming futility of it all, then you're right where I want you. <laughs> Because something can't be mended if we don't know it's broken. We have to recognize the brokenness of sin. We have to be able to see it, identify it, feel it. Because once we know in our hearts and our minds what sin is, what it feels, feels like, what it looks like, acted out in our own lives, then we can start exploring the opposite. Now, I know it seems like the opposite of sinfulness would be saintliness, but I don't think many of us are bucking for sainthood. It's not realistic to think that we can lead perfect saintly lives. If we look at John and Susanna's definitions of sin as those things that impair or obscure our relationship with God, those transgressions of the law of love, like John said, then I would say that the opposite of sinfulness is obedience. Obedience to our tender conscience. Obedience to our sense of God. Obedience to the law of love. Saint Benedict said that obedience is the willingness to listen for the voice of God in life. If the insidiousness of sin is constantly tugging at us and appealing to our baser desires and instincts, then obedience is the conscious choice to make the time to listen for the voice of God calling to our conscience, calling to our reason, calling to our spirits, calling us to follow the law of love in every interaction we have. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean the struggle goes away. We can desire to be obedient, but we do not always follow through on that desire. We can will it, 
but we don't always do it. This conflict between good and evil, right and wrong, sinfulness and obedience, it's the tug of war that's constantly played out in our hearts and lives. It's the struggle between willing and doing, of having good intentions and then actually acting on them. We can feel torn between the wannas and the oughtas, what we wanna do and what we oughta do. And it can all make us feel broken, that our haves are at war with each other. Now, I know that this series is subtitled Good News for Tough Times, and right now none of this sounds like particularly good news. But that's okay, because sometimes we need to lament. Sometimes we need to mourn. Sometimes we need to cry out in frustration. Sometimes we need to acknowledge the brokenness and the struggles that we have in life. We can't always just leap to joy. Sometimes we need to sit with the brokenness. We need to feel the discomfort. We need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so this week, I want you to think about these things. Where do you see brokenness within yourself? Where are those tug of wars with your life? What are those things that are sin to you that may not be sin to anyone else? Where do you chafe at obedience to the law of love? And then look at your community around you. Where do you see local examples of brokenness in the community? Systems that are imbalanced and don't work fairly and justly for all people. And then look around the country and our whole world. Where do you see brokenness in our common human experience? After you've had a chance to reflect on these things, I want you to pray. I want you to, to lift the broken pieces up to God and say, help us, guide us, be with us, mend us in our brokenness, make us whole. And of course, then I hope you will put some hands and feet on those prayers by looking for the ways that God is already working for wholeness in our world and find ways to cooperate with that work. We know that it takes time for bones to knit, for scars to form, for tissues to regrow. It takes time for epoxy to harden and Gorilla Glue to dry. It's not easy to fix broken things. So let's not rush the process. This week, let's sit with it. We live in a broken world with broken systems as broken people. But God is here with us in the brokenness. And as the great prophet Leonard Cohen said, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Amen. Take a moment to prepare your communion elements. Bread and grape juice are what we use traditionally. You may use whatever you have that is most similar to that. Today, as we have been exploring the brokenness of our world and our lives, it is appropriate that we confess our sin before God and one another. So I encourage you to follow along with the liturgy which you see in your worship guide. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will, we have broken your law, we have rebelled against your love, we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. 
free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us take a moment of silent prayer to turn the contents of our hearts over to God. Hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenants to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from the slavery of sin and death, and made covenant with us by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I invite you, wherever you are, to lift up your elements as I bless them. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered far and wide and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his love. 
By your spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Zion is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us take a moment to receive this holy mystery. If you are by yourself, I encourage you to take a piece of bread, dip it into the juice, and say the body and blood of Christ. And if you are with someone else that you can serve communion to, take turns receiving. And as you serve one another, say the body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ. I want to thank you once again for your continued generosity during this time when we learn how to be church in all new ways as we are spread far and wide, continuing to worship God together and being Christ's hands and feet wherever we are. I so appreciate your continued donations of your tithes and offerings that keep the ministry of the church alive and well. If you would like to make a donation to Homer United Methodist Church, you can visit our website down below. You'll find our online donation portal there, or you are welcome to send a check to the street address that you see on the screen. Thank you so much for your generosity. As we go forth this week, committed to examining the brokenness in our own lives and in the world around us, be assured that we do not walk alone, that God is with us and our Christian brothers and sisters are by our sides every step of the way. May patience pave our way. May hope comfort our world and may love guide our lives. Go forth today with patience, hope, and love. Amen. <laughs>